Well, Star Trek the motion picture brought Star Trek back uh, and brought it to movie screens, but it wasn't quite uh, the big return that uh, I think people wanted. Even though of the Star Trek films, and that includes all of them, it's probably the most science fiction themed uh, film of uh, of the whole uh, shebang, um, albeit a plot that they had already covered in the TV series. But uh, well, what are you gonna do? <laughs> and there's a lot of aspects about it that's pretty cool. And sometimes I'd like to think that there's an era there between the two films. Uh, of that look and feel of the Enterprise and that there's more years, uh, narratively speaking, between the two than there actually were. And uh, it, it's notable within the film, it seems to suggest that it's only a couple of years after the five-year mission ended and uh, Kirk gets promoted to Admiral and all that. And uh, so now it's much later for the second film, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. And uh, it, it, one wonders if everybody remembered Khan at the time. You know, I mean, the, the reruns were still showing, and they said, "Oh, they're going to do something about that," or if they just thought it was some Klingon or something. You know, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but to they went back and uh, decided to start again, really. And Star Trek Two is very much. It's almost as if it is the first Star Trek film. Uh, so they decided to start over. And uh, they brought in uh, Harb Bennett and Nicholas Meyer, and what can they do for Star Trek? And uh, these were not Star Trek guys, but it speaks volumes of how things happen today when they bring in somebody to to be the overseer of some project, especially one that's connected to some big franchise they're trying to breathe new life into. And we we've seen that a lot over the past I don't know ten fifteen years now. And uh, a lot of that is, is brought down by, obviously, the politics and all that sort of stuff. But at the same time, it's also brought down by just bad work ethic and laziness. Whereas here, you had two guys who didn't know much about Star Trek. So, gee, what do you do? Well, they watch Star Trek. <laughs> so if they studied it, what could we craft for this film? And uh, came upon Space Seed, apparently. Maybe there were some others. i kind of foggy on the details. I've heard the stories about it and how the development happened and all that. Uh, and maybe there was another episode they might have thought about. But this one kind of leaves it open, especially Spock himself. So, because the name of the show, Space Seed, is like, it would be interesting to come back and see what, what grew from the seed we planted today. Well, whatever was going to grow didn't happen. <laughs> as we learn uh, in this film. Now, the film itself is dealing with the fact that, uh, you know, it's much years later. The prime years of Kirk's life and everything is behind him. He's a much older man, and he's feeling it, and it's depressing him, and uh, he's no longer in command. And that's why I like to think of this as being further removed from the motion picture era like he'd had some other mission, maybe five more years out in space in that ship, and then he's back to just being an admiral overseeing uh, the academy and training cadets and that sort of thing. And that's how it is when we open in that where Savick is being trained in the Kobe Ma Kobayashi Maru, uh, which uh, has become famous uh, throughout Star Trek lore and is telling into how does Kirk win against Khan and all of this. And several times over, it, the, the movie demonstrates what it uh, what Kirk does here. Khan is every bit Kirk's superior because that's he was genetically designed to be so. He was part of the eugenics wars. This was an element of Star Trek lore that they developed uh, in Space Seed and all of that. And even in the movie, uh, 1996 is the <laughs> well. <laughs> And going forward, if, if, well, if we were going forward, I don't know what becomes of Star Trek now, but if someone did, I've often thought that the time travel creates reverberations. Even despite your best efforts not to mess with the timeline, it's still going to mess with it by your very presence. And so all oh, things get pushed a little further and are different, even when you come back and you might not even be aware of it in your, in your own timeline or what have you. That sort of thing, just even dialogue could answer it.
So that sort of stuff happens, but yeah, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> so, so Khan and crew are on the planet that Kirk left them on, uh, but it's not quite the way it was before. And uh, check off now on board the Reliant with Captain Tyrell. Now, this it, it, it often said that Star Trek II is the best of the Star Trek films. And it's often said because it's true. It, it flat out is. that None of them have, have beaten it. Uh, there's other films that are enjoyable and fun. Uh, certainly Star Trek IV is. But Star Trek Wrath of Khan is just special in its own way. It's just damn near uh, flawless uh, as a Trek film. Um, but... <laughs> Uh, when it came to the Reliant, I often thought that it should have been uh, Sulu's ship and uh, Chekhov is his first officer. And now for the scene that ultimately happens where Captain Tyrell kills himself. Well, you can't have Sulu doing that. So they could have had a third man as part of that group for that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, and, of course, they rejoin Kirk's uh, ship. Because one of the things about with their age and everything they wouldn't be still doing the same jobs they used to do in their youth. They're, they, you know, they've elevated in command. So it, it, it certainly makes sense that Chekhov is on this other ship, and he's he's a, he's a commander. He's a second. He's the first officer. Um, uh, but Sulu, uh, with his experience and whatnot, it, and eventually they get him there where he's the captain of the Excelsior and all that. But he should have been the captain of the Reliant, I think. And uh, you know, uh, nothing against Captain Tyrell. He's a good actor and everything. Uh, but, you know, and it's one of those things where you already have an established cast that's uh, quite a few people. Adding in more people is, you know, it's going to get a little crowded. So you got your villain, his crew, and then you got the business with Carol Marcus and David. And uh, that's all you need. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, it's just one of those things I kind of wish they had done. But, you know, it's still the best damn Star Trek film uh, of all time. So Kirk, of course, is depressed. He's dealing w with aging and whatnot. And uh, McCoy says, just get back command. You know, that's what you want to do. You're wasting away here and all of that. But uh, he's dubious that he should do that. But he goes on this inspection where the Enterprise is basically being used to train these cadets, which is already a sign that the Enterprise, the age of the Enterprise is well beyond uh, what it's supposed to be, that it's not one of the later ships. And later on, they deal with that in the other movies. Uh, it's already too old, really, to be in service. And it's only through the circumstances of Khan taking over the Reliant, uh, sticking those uh, earwicks into the ears of <laughs> Chekhov and uh, Terrell. <laughs> um, and so all of that stuff. Now, that, okay, and of course the other flaw is uh, Khan recognizes Chekhov. Well, how? Chekhov had not been introduced to the cast yet when Space Seed happened. But... Eh, I guess you could sort of guess that maybe he was just a little cadet running around on the ship. <laughs> we just didn't see him. And, and, and then he, he's elevated to an ensign, you know, later on. <laughs> and gets an assignment on the bridge and all that. Uh, so, okay. <laughs> but imagine if it had been uh, Chekhov and Sulu. And, of course, I'm trying to recover. I don't... Was Sulu in that episode? He might have been on shore leave then. But, you know... <laughs> He, he, had been, he was one of the early uh, characters established in the series, so stands the reason he was around. Um, but if they had both been there, that would have you know, cleared that up for that scene. But anyway, uh, so it's very telling that they do the Kabayashi Maru. They do uh, Kirk uh, in his depression, and then the circumstances cause him back. And then, of course, Spock, being a Vulcan, he's not... Of course, he has a much longer lifespan. <laughs> he's not all that bothered. And he, he's aware that there's something a little off about Kirk. You know, he wishes him happy birthday, and Kirk's not happy about it and all that, even despite his being a Vulcan. And whatever the troubles he was having uh, in motion picture, he's dealt with it, and now he's getting more to the more uh, stabilized Spock, where he's basically embra embraced both sides of his, uh, you know, his mind and his personality and all that. Uh, and of course, he's like, take a man. I don't care. 
I think Kirk's like, I don't want to, you know, horn in on your action. He's like, nah, I'm just here to teach the kids. But when we're going on a mission, we need the most experienced leaders. Of, you know, flawless logic of Spock. And so they go. The one element that is the science fiction element of this, uh, besides it's really just, a, you know, a, a battle of ships and whatnot, ultimately. But it's the Genesis Project. And this is one of those where they had, uh, you know, they had the new graphics that hadn't been seen before and they just, that debuted here in this film and all that. And it's all very cool. And uh, the consequences of that, which uh, very wisely plays out into the next film and actually continues, if you want to, about the, the consequences of that whole ordeal into the fourth film and so on and so forth. But uh, the, certainly the, the concept of, uh, of instantaneous, uh, you know, like terraforming as opposed to over years to, you know, bring life to a mostly dead planet. Uh, but here with Genesis, <laughs> does it in six minutes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the conversation, McCoy is the one who eventually, you know, initially discovers how threatening this is and all that. And of course, that's plot point for the next film. But uh, so that's your science fiction element for the story, for the most part. Uh, the real story is Khan's obsession with revenge, Kirk's depression, and uh, what brings him back, what brings him out of it is he's, 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 his worthiness is being captain. He feels like he's got purpose and stuff, even though Khan outfoxes him at first and all that. But ultimately, again and again and again, it displays how Kirk wins and why he's a uh, uh, force to be reckoned with. It's because, um, well, he cheats. <laughs> <laughs> and Khan's mistake and his flaw is, of course, his obsession with Kirk. And uh, we, even though time and time again, it's like even his, his protege is telling, look, he got everything. Let's get out of here. You know, who cares? You know, you, you already really beaten Kirk. You know, you're free and all that. It's all very true. But he can't give him up. That's why he's quoting Moby Dick and all that. And so that's the deal. He's obsessed. Uh, and Kirk ultimately uses this against him as he's cheating. So what does he do? Of course, to Kobe Ashimaru, we understand how he's the only cadet who beat the test of the no-win scenario. And, well, he cheated. He rewrote the program so that there was a way out because I don't believe in the no-win situation. And so... <laughs> And so again and again, he's finding ways to cheat death. And so Khan's got him dead to rights. He wants Genesis and for Kirk to beam over so he can kill him in person and all that stuff. And But Kirk knows these ships better than he does. And of course, his experience is another advantage. And Khan's making a mistake because he's so blinded by his obsession and he thinks, oh, I've got him. And he can't see this coming where they had, Kirk understands the computer codes of the ships and he can, for the, for the moment, uh, take over Reliance computers and shut down their, their shields and attack. So he does, and Khan's caught, you know, flailing about. He can't, because he doesn't know the ships as well as Kirk does. He knows the ships because back in the show in Spacey, they allowed him access to their libraries, and uh, he's a genius, a super, you know, Superman genius, and he was able to absorb enough information to, you know, to, he can get around on these ships. And uh, so that's that's fine. That's explained. And so it works, you know. And Khan's all pissed off. So now both ships are damaged. They can they can't leave the scene and all that stuff. Uh, Kirk's investigating a regular one, and he finds uh, the the people Khan slaughtered, and discovers pe some people just escaped into this dead moon. They beam down into it. That's where the first Genesis experiment took place. And it's like this Garden of Eden in there, and all that stuff. Khan knows none of this. And then Tyrell and Chekhov attack, but it falls apart. The the worms in their ears <laughs> have gone too far, and they can't even obey his orders anymore. Um, and all that stuff. But Kirk, but Khan decides, I'm just going to leave Kirk there, you know, and I'm going to leave you there trapped in that dead world like you left me, and I'll let you suffer as you linger wishing I had killed you, and that sort of thing, and that's his revenge. The only other flaw there is he tells Captain Tyrell to kill Kirk, I don't think he would have done that. I think uh, certainly leaving him there to torture him, he would do. But the idea that he couldn't do it himself, I, I don't know. I don't think that would have happened. But uh, maybe they could have rewritten that for them to do something else for Tyrell to freak out and kill himself. But um, so that's, you know, it's a slight flaw, but, uh, it, you know, it's there. Um, but after that, and this is the scene 
that everybody makes fun of because it's Shatner and stuff, but actually it's a lot smarter than I think people give it credit uh, because the reason Kirk is so over the top in his response to Khan over this is because he's selling it to Khan. He's giving Khan what he wants because that's how he's tricking him and fooling him and cheating him again. <laughs> so, you know, Khan! Khan! <laughs> that's why he's doing because the whole time he knows um, everything's fine. I, I can leave when I want to. <laughs> Because he and Spock had already set it up, you know. They just they needed to do their little repairs and whatnot. And, of course, he reveals to Savick, hey, how'd you beat it? Well, I cheated. And then he pulls his communicator out. Hey, Spock, let's go. And they're, what? 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 <laughs> and so they're, and they're off to the right. they got to go to the Matura Nebula. That's their only shot uh, to blind Khan. Uh, but then the, the problem is they're blind as well. And one last little thing, you know, the, the Khan's following them. They're going. They're going to make it to the the nebula. He can't stop them, and uh, and then uh, his lieutenant or whatever he tells him, hey, well, if we go in there, we'll have no shields and we'll be practically blind." And all and he's like, "Oh yeah, damn." So then Kirk gets on the the, the communicator, you know, "Hey, Khan." <laughs> To, to lure him in and you know, he falls for it hook line and sinker and the battle is on and then it's kind of like a balance of terror almost you know because they can't see not very well anyway and you've got quite the battle in the uh in the in the nebula but ultimately Khan loses and his last ditch effort is to set off the genesis device which is you know the great uh contingency plan he has one could hope that he's still watching the screen as the ship manages to warp out and he's like what no oh, damn it and then got <laughs> it blows up yeah they didn't they, they didn't do that scene <laughs> uh but then shocker of shocker uh they couldn't uh fix the the warp core and uh, all the radiation was pouring out and so no one could go into the chamber to do it so spock goes in and as a Vulcan, he could survive long enough to fix it and set set them up so they could hit warp and get the hell out of there, which they do. It saves the ship and everybody. And then the Genesis Project explodes, creating a planet out of all out of the material of of a cloud. Uh, wow, it's quite miraculous, you know. And but then sadly, uh, Spock dies. And even though you know how things turn out later, it's just gut wrenching and sad. And despite all his cheating, this is the scene. Uh, Kirk can't, he can't beat this one. And uh, he collapses, you know. And so there's consequences. You know, I mean, he, he cheated, he cheated, and then there's a conversation with his son, you know. And, uh, he, you know, and he says, yes, I've never faced death. I've always believed there was a way around it. And this time there wasn't. Although there is. He just doesn't know it yet. But, <laughs> but still within the film itself uh, th those are the consequences of uh, Kirk's greatest talent which is is uh, the bluff and the cheat you know you can go back to the corpormite maneuver and stuff like that where he bluffed his way out <laughs> stuff like that you know but hey it worked and uh, but this time uh, he had to pay a heavy price and he lost Spock and uh, of course it's uh, uh, it's quite the tearjerker at the end of that uh, of course a lot of people don't like the search for spock but i do i think it's a pretty cool movie and fun and this but it you know it kind of it says yeah it takes away the significance of one's passing and, and that sort of thing uh because in real life it's not like that but um well what are you gonna do so uh you, you, they wanted the franchise to continue and, and no spock i don't think so <laughs> so uh, and so there you are. There's the clues. You know, he mind melds with McCoy. And then his casket rests on uh, Genesis of all the names of a planet <laughs> to looking like the Garden of Eden and everything. So there you are with the Wrath of Khan. Uh, and just everybody uh, did their jobs. It, it was, uh, despite the little things that I quibble with here, it, it doesn't really matter. It, it is the best Star Trek film of the batch and and um, deserves the respect that it's been given and it's something they've kind of chased here and there uh, the next generation tried to repeat it I think even 
and Nicholas Meyer tried to kind of repeat it with this, uh, uh, the Undiscovered Country, and, and then the absolute worst attempt was Into Darkness, which is just an insult to the film, and just the, the stupidest idea of doing something like that. Just incredible. After following up the first film, which wasn't too bad, it was actually pretty good. It's got some stupid stuff in it, but it's pretty good, and then that? Ugh. But I shouldn't have even mentioned it. I, uh, <laughs> but Wrath of Khan, uh, yeah, that's the best one. Uh, the James Horner music is absolutely amazing. Uh, that was one of the first albums I ever bought as a kid. <laughs> was that soundtrack. <laughs> and it's like this running battle between him and Jerry Goldsmith. They're both so good, and they're both these nautical sounds to them. Uh, but get, uh, Goldsmith, I guess, wins out because it became the next generation theme, you know, at least the, the main theme. Um, and I think both of them had to whip this up pretty quick. You know, there's always deadlines and stuff. And it's amazing that they did. He, he does, he does, uh, Horner scores the next one, which is pretty good too. And especially if you get the, like, the deluxe album, there's more, uh, pieces of music and stuff that's really good. He was really, uh, his music was, uh, it was repetitive, and a lot of times that was because he was in the middle. He had to rush off to do aliens and stuff like that, and it sounds a lot like the Star Trek soundtrack, uh, and stuff like that. But, but it was always really, really beautiful, and especially his work for Cocoon and stuff like that. That was really good. Um, and, uh, sadly, he's no longer with this. And Goldsmith, of course, is just a legend. Um, but uh, those two guys were the best of the Star Trek music uh, for the films. And so, so just a nice package all around. And um, probably will never be beat as far as Star Trek goes. But that's just the way it is. <laughs> 